It began back in November of 1985 when a hunter came across a barrel near Bear Brook State Park. Inside the barrel, two bodies, that of an adult female and young girl that she was related to. Then 15 years later, another barrel was discovered about 100 yards from the first. Inside that barrel, the bodies of two young girls, one of whom was related to the woman. Officials say that all four died from blunt force trauma and were bound in a similar fashion. There's no time. No. The time is 13 o'clock. Hey there, and welcome to episode 74 of the 13 o'clock podcast. This is going to be kind of an unusual episode. I'm going to be flying solo this time around. If any of you saw the post that I made, I posted on the blog and I posted on the Facebook page and on Twitter and things like that. Um, Tom actually had a family emergency and he had to fly to Mississippi to visit his father who was going to be having quadruple bypass surgery. So he kind of took a last minute flight. I'm recording this on Saturday. So he took the last minute flight last night and got there last night. So he's going to be spending the next week with his dad and his family, and uh, hopefully that will all go very well. So we kind of thought about not doing the episode, just like skipping a week and stuff like that. But I was like, you know, I already researched all this, this week's topic and everything. So I figured, you know, I could just do one by myself. And who knows, I might even just like stick in some old footage of Tom from other shows, like making funny comments or something like that. We'll see how it goes. Man. And I might actually also have to do um, our weekly movie review by myself too, because I don't, he's not going to be back until uh, the Friday after this episode comes out. So that might be just me too. So I might take that opportunity to do a David Lynch movie. He he he, because he doesn't like those so much. So, <laughs> so I'm going to do one by myself so I can just like squee about David Lynch all I want and he won't make fun of me. I did that shit and it was cool. So anyway, we have a pretty cool show. It's a true crime extravaganza. You know how much I love those. Going to talk about the Ketty murders. Going to talk about the Bear Brook murders, which actually I start I hadn't uh, I hadn't been researching those for a while, but when I researched them for the show, it turns out that there have actually been a lot of uh, developments in that case in the past couple of years, and they think they might have solved it. So uh, we'll get into that a little bit too, and of course we're going to do our current events segment also, which is also uh, true crime related. So it all kind of goes together, and I like when that happens. Before we do that, I'm going to do the regular shout outs. My book, The Faceless Villain, obviously is still out if you're into true crime and you want to read a compilation of all the unsolved creepy true crimes that happened between 1900 and 1959, then that is available. I still have some codes for the audiobooks if you would like a free copy of the audiobook. Um, just get in touch with me on YouTube or send me your email and I will get you a code. I still have a few left. And thank you to all the people that have requested them so far and have written reviews uh, of the book and stuff like that. That's really, really much appreciated. And uh, you'll be happy to know that I've been working on the second volume, which is going to cover murders from 1960 to 1980. So I'm, you know, right in the fifth chapter of that. And I'm hoping to get that out before summertime, like sometime in the spring, I'm kind of shooting for. So we'll see how that goes. The audiobook may take longer, obviously, because, you know, it's more technical bullshit and all that other kind of stuff. But we'll see. And I'm really trying to work on it and get it done so I can get it out of here. Also, we just did a movie review for the 1979 TV miniseries Salem's Lot featuring the very, very scary Kurt Barlow vampire and also that creepy scene with the kid floating outside the window. So uh, go check that out if you haven't already. Like I said, our next movie review will probably just me, but we'll see how it goes. And uh, it'll probably be a David Lynch movie because, you know, those because <laughs> that's the one that I wanted to do. And I feel like Tom kind of didn't want to do it and kept putting it off. So that'll probably be the next one we do. So keep an eye out for that. Also, as always, if you like the show and would like to support it, then you can check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast. If you do not like Patreon and would like to make a one-time or monthly or whatever donation using PayPal, then you can do that as well. You can go to our blog at 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com and there is a link right there in the sidebar to a PayPal account that will support the show. 
Also, and I think I mentioned this on the last couple episodes, this will probably be the last time I mention it, but starting with our uh, new shows in 2018, we're also starting to put the names of all our patrons and donors and stuff like that in the credits of the show or in the descriptions of the audio podcast. So that's another little extra added perk there if you're into that. Now, let's get into our current event. Now, this is actually a story that goes back to the 90s, but... It's kind of current in the news because this dude just went on trial again for yet another series of murders. Now, apparently this is one of the world's worst serial killers if he gets convicted of these murders that he's standing trial for now. He's not real, since he's Russian, I guess he's not real known in America because I had really never heard of him or only vaguely heard of him. And uh, his name is Mikhail Popkov. And he is known as the werewolf murderer or the Wednesday murderer, also known as the Angarsk maniac. That's what the Russian media calls him. So this guy, the BBC reported on January 10th that this guy is going on trial again. Now, he was already serving a life sentence in Russia. He was convicted in 2015 of murdering 22 women or 24 women. The sources kind of differ on that. And he confessed to all of those and stuff like that. Now, it turns out that this trial that he's undergoing now, it's because he confessed to an additional 60 murders, which if you're not good at math, his total, that would bring his total to more than 80 victims, which, damn, holy shit. I mean, he's really a bad dude. And the creepiest thing about him is that he got away with it for a really long time because he seemed like a normal dude and also because he was a cop. So he would kind of, you know, he would drive around in his cop car in his cop uniform and stuff like that. And he would, you know, lure people into his car that way because, you know, they thought, oh, he's a cop and it's safe and stuff like that. He's like, yeah, I'll drive you home to safety. And then, no, he would rape and kill them. Yeah, this guy is horrifying. So like I said, if he gets convicted of these murders that he's on trial for now that just started in January, then that'll be over 80 people. All of them women, except I I think he killed one man. But other than that, all women, almost all raped also. Uh, Some of them were cut up, dismembered, um, all kinds of shit like that. And he actually kind of got his start in around 1992, in and around Siberia, around Irkutsk, that city. Um, And like I said, he's been a cop there for a really long time. He was a cop until 1998. And even after that, you know, he was still using his cop thing as like a way to lure victims. Now, the first murder he committed, I mean, to hear him tell it, it almost seems kind of like he thought of it as sort of like a lark. Like he had this woman in his car and he's kind of like, gee, I think I'll rape and kill this chick kind of thing. And then evidently, I guess he developed a taste for it and started doing it over. Now, the reason that he gives is that he was one of these dudes that was like, well, he didn't agree with women going out to bars or going out to clubs without their husbands or boyfriends, like going out unaccompanied or just going out with their girlfriends or whatever. So he had that thing where he thought he was punishing them. He was, quote unquote, cleansing the streets of prostitutes, which, you know, whatever. And uh, so, yeah, he was doing that kind of thing. He would like kind of use his patrol car. He would like lurk around bars or whatever and see women that were coming out of places that were kind of inebriated. And he'd be like, hey, I'm a cop. I'll give you a ride home safely. And, you know, they would be like, "Okay, fine. And then he would get in the car. He would drive him to some remote location in the woods and he would rape and kill them. Usually used an axe or a knife or, you know, whatever was around and stuff like that. Now, he was doing this for a while and he only got caught because this one girl that he had picked up, and I think she was only 15 at the time, he picked her up and he took her out in the woods and he threw her against a tree, like bashed her head against a tree and knocked her unconscious or partly unconscious and then started to rape her. Now he left her for dead and it was freezing cold. She was naked, all this other kind of shit, but she lived and they found her the next day. She was like walking around and she walked and got help. And she, all she could remember, she couldn't really remember what he looked like very well, but she did remember that he was a cop. So at that point, you know, the authorities were like, well, 
all the cops in this area have to give us DNA. So they got them to do that and they got this shithead's DNA and they're like, hey, it's you. Now, the creepiest thing about this too is that this dude has a wife and his wife also was in law enforcement. She worked for the police also. It's really not known. They don't think that she was in on it or that she even knew what he was doing. Now, she did give him an alibi a couple of times, like when they were like, well, where was he this night? She's like, oh, he was with me or something like that when he wasn't. But they're not real clear about if she knew. She seemed super shocked because she said he always seemed like a normal person. He was a good husband. He had a daughter. They had a daughter. You know, he was a good father, all this other stuff. Yeah, the daughter is a school teacher. And in a lot of ways, the wife and the daughter are still kind of in denial. You know, the daughter has even been quoted. I think she was quoted. I think it was in the Siberian Times where, you know, she was saying, I really don't think it was him. He just seemed like a normal guy. We did normal dad-daughter stuff. You know, she's like, if it was him, I'd like to be able to look him in the face and have him tell me that he really did do it. And maybe then I would believe it. But the, the whole story is just horrible. And it's like, I couldn't even imagine, like, if you were with somebody for a really long time, because they'd been married a very long time. I mean, the, the daughter's grown. She's in her 20s. And, you know, to find out that not only is your husband and dad a serial killer, but he's like one of the worst serial killers in history. He's just going around. He's killed at least 80 people that they know of and maybe more. And he doesn't seem super uh, remorseful about it. Uh, it must be said. He just kind of seems like, yeah, it's just something I do. I I punish them. He's like, oh, I tried to cover up the crimes because I knew it was illegal. I'm like, oh yeah, really? Okay. So it's just a horrifying, horrifying story. Like I said, one of the world's worst serial killers, Russian fellow, Mikhail Popkov. Go and look that shit up. There's not, he doesn't even have a Wikipedia page, not in English anyway, not that I could find. There is a thing about him on Murderpedia where there's uh, several articles about him and shit like that. I had actually never really heard of him until I looked into this story, you know, for the news segment and stuff like that. And the dude is just horrifying and creepy looking and I just can't deal with it. So that'll do it for the news portion of the episode. So let's get into the main topics of the episode. Uh, like I said, it's kind of a true crime extravaganza. So, you know, if the shit about the werewolf killer wasn't horrifying enough, then just stay tuned. It gets worse. Um, but anyway, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the infamous Ketty murders. Now this was actually a request, although it was on my list already because it was, it's a case that I've always been kind of fascinated with. And it's one that seems to have captured the public imagination. It seems to have turned up on a lot of like creepiest unsolved murders cases and stuff like that. Now this crime took place in 1981 in a little bitty town called Ketty. It's a resort community in Northern California, about 87 miles from Reno. Now, evidently it used to be kind of a swing in place. You know, a lot of people would go there for, uh, you know, for vacations and they would rent these little cabins and stuff like that. But by the time the eighties rolled around, uh, people didn't really come there anymore for vacation and stuff like that. So they had started renting the cabins out to low income families, which was actually kind of working out because it was a nice place to raise a family. It was safe and, you know, it was, reasonably priced and stuff like that. So pretty much all the cabins were permanently rented out by families. So the trouble occurred on April 21st, 1981. Now the woman that lived in the cabin was named Glenna Sue Sharp, usually known as Sue. And she had five children. She was 36 years old. So she was at home in the cabin, which is famously cabin number 28. She was in the house. Also in the house was Two of her kids, Ricky and Greg, who were 10 and 5, respectively. Also a friend of theirs named Justin. She also had a 12-year-old daughter, Tina, who was home. She had another daughter named uh, Sheila, who was 14. Uh, she was actually staying with neighbors uh, at the ca either the cabin next door or the second cabin down. Now, she also had a son who was 15, and his name was Johnny. And Johnny had a friend named Dana Wingate, who was 17, and they were both staying at the house also. Well, they earlier they were out, um, they were at Quincy, which was a town nearby, and they were kind of hanging out with friends and stuff like that, but they came back later that night. Now, what the authorities think occurred at some time during that night, the two boys, Johnny and Dana, they somehow came home from wherever they were, hanging out with their friends or whatever. Maybe they hitchhiked or something like that. Now, it's not known whether they got home before the murders took place or whether they walked in on the murders taking place, but whatever occurred, they got murdered. When the daughter Sheila came home the next morning, she found the bodies. Now, this was 
an unbelievably vicious attack. All of the victims had been stabbed and bludgeoned. They were tied up and it was just a really gruesome, gruesome scene. And I have some crime scene photos. I'll put those in the YouTube videos. Uh, if you're squeamish, you might not want to look at them because they're pretty gross. So Sue and Johnny, the 15 year old son, they were bludgeoned to death with a hammer and both stabbed repeatedly. The friend, Dana, who was 17, was strangled and stabbed. Now, the 12 year old daughter, Tina, was missing. So she had been taken from the cabin and they actually didn't know what happened to her for a while. Now, the weirdest thing is that the three younger boys, the two sons, Ricky and Greg, who were 10 and five, like I said, and their friend, Justin, who was actually the son of their neighbors, they were in a bedroom of the cabin and they were fine. Now, there's some speculation that they're like, well, they could have slept through the murders. I don't really, I mean, if you've seen pictures of the cabin, it's been torn down now, but the cabin itself is very small. So some people were like, well, maybe because they did find like a little bit of a bloody fingerprint or like little fingerprints on the doorknob of the bedroom that actually maybe one of the kids had kind of opened the door and seen it happening and then closed the door because they were scared or freaked out. But most reports say that they slept through the attack, which seems crazy uh, because of the brutality. And I mean, there was just, there was blood everywhere. There was stab marks in the walls and shit like that. So, you know, this was somebody on a fucking rampage pretty much. Now, from the start, authorities were kind of, they were operating under the assumption that they're like, well, the brutality of this crime and the fact that Sue in particular, I mean, the bindings that were around her wrists were really, really tight. Um, she had been stabbed so many times, you know, just the brutality of it. It seemed like, you know, what they call overkill, which usually suggests someone who knows the victims because right a random stranger wouldn't necessarily have that much of a reason to do all that shit to you and i mean i should mention too as kind of a demonstration of the violence of this attack that one of the knives that was used in the crime i mean they had the killer had stabbed the people so much that the knife the the blade of the knife was bent damn right so, you know, they weren't fucking around. Now, like I said, the 12-year-old the girl, Tina, she was missing from the cabin. Now, they found one spot of blood on her bed, like on the bed sheet, but they didn't find her for a really long time. They found her three years later. They actually found a skull uh, that they later determined was hers, and it was about 29 miles away from the murder site. So whoever killed her had taken her 30 miles for whatever reason. Now, when they did an examination of Tina's skull, they determined that Tina had probably been killed right around the time the rest of the family were. So whatever reason, the killer took the daughter 30 miles away and then killed her either that day or the following day. They're not really sure why. Now, during the investigation... Like I said, operating under the assumption that this was probably somebody that they knew, the first person that they looked at was a guy named Martin Smart. Now, Martin Smart was actually the father of Justin, the little boy who had been in the cabin. And they were, uh, they lived in cabin 26, him and Justin and his wife, Marilyn. And they were friends of Sue Sharp and the kids. Now, Martin, known as Marty, also had a friend who had been staying there, and his name is Bo, and I hope I'm pronouncing this, it's either Bo Bede or Bo Bede or something like that. And this Bo person, uh, they had only just met a few weeks before. Uh, evidently, they had met at a VA hospital where Bo was being treated for PTSD or Marty was being treated for PTSD. I'm not real sure about that. So they know that night that Bo, Marty, and Marilyn, Marty's wife, had stopped by Sue's cabin and they were going to go out to the bar and they invited her to come along. But Sue said no. Now, evidently, according to witnesses at this bar, Marty got belligerent over some music that was playing that he evidently didn't like. And he went and talked to the manager about it and all this other stuff. And there was a big scene. So then later on, they went home and then Marilyn, the wife, she said, well, I just went to bed. But then Marty, who called the bar again before he went back and was like, hey, that music really sucked. Like, you know, I guess he really, really hated this music. But then him and Bo went back to the bar. So the thing about this is that even though Marty and Bo seemed like decent suspects, they were actually cleared fairly quickly. And this is sort of odd because 
Marty's wife, Marilyn, told police that the day after the murders, she had actually left her husband, right? She also said that he had a very violent temper and that he often beat her up. Now, the Department of Justice evidently gave Marty Smart a polygraph and he supposedly passed it. But the thing about the Ketty murders is that, and a lot of people, there's a, you know, there's a lot of stuff about this on the internet and stuff like that. And pretty much all of them say that it's suspected that there was some kind of cover up or that the cops knew that Marty and Bo had done it, but let them off for whatever reason. Because it did seem like the interviews that the police and the Department of Justice conducted with these two guys were not very thorough. They seemed like they were just asking them kind of softball questions, and they weren't really following up on things. Like when they contradicted themselves in their statements, they didn't really, they didn't really follow up on that, which seemed a little odd. Like, for example, when Bo was being interviewed, at the beginning of the interview, he said he didn't know which cabin it was that the murders had been committed at. But then a little while later, while the interview was still going on, he said that he did know which cabin it was. And then, but the cop didn't really pick up on that. And like I said, there are some transcripts of it online and stuff like that. But they said when he contradicted himself like that, the detective just said, oh, I thought you'd know, like what cabin it was. Well, we'll point it out to you on the way back. So they didn't say, hey, man, you said you didn't know which cabin it was, or you said you did know which cabin it was, and now you say you don't know what the fuck is up with that. Like, they didn't really follow up on it. And Bo also lied to police uh, about several different things, which he didn't really have to lie about. He actually said that Marilyn Smart was his niece, which was weird because they weren't related. And also... He said that he'd been in Ketty for a month, even though he had only been there less than two weeks. He also said that he had never met Sue Sharp, the woman that was murdered in Cabin 28, even though pretty much every other witness said, of course, he knew her. I mean, they lived right there. And it was also very suspicious that Bo said that they got to the bar between 9.30 and 10 that night. But then later on, he said, no, it was later. It was midnight. Because, you know, that would square with the time of the murder more, like he was trying to do an alibi. Now, there was also some similar weirdness when they were interviewing Marty Smart. I mean, he told the police that his son Justin could have seen something on that night, quote, without me detecting him, which seemed a little incriminating. They also, the police did not follow up on this. He also said he knew that a hammer had been used to beat the victims And he mentioned, without the police even asking him, that he had a hammer that had gone missing sometime before. And that was also never followed up on. Even worse than that, it's... It seems like, like I said, the cops didn't do any any follow-up on anything. They let Marty move away, which, you know, they really shouldn't have done. And Bo moved away also. He went back to Reno. Even more suspiciously, uh, just a few months after the murder, the Plumas County Sheriff, who was like, you know, the main sheriff of the county where the murders took place, his name was Doug Thomas, he announced his resignation. No one really knew why. He didn't really give a reason. So this case went unsolved for a very, very, very long time, and it still is officially unsolved. But many years later, um, a lot of new evidence came to light that suggests that Marty and Bo probably were the killers. Marty and Bo are actually both dead now. So even if they did do it, you know, there's no way of prosecuting them or anything like that. Uh, Marty died in 2010. His therapist came forward and told police that Marty had told him that he had killed Sue Sharp. Like he confessed to the therapist, allegedly. And this therapist also said that Martin Smart was friends with Doug Thomas, the sheriff who had investigated the case, who had resigned a month after the murders. And also, Marty allegedly told his therapist that the that he had killed Sue because she was trying to interfere with his marriage. Like, Sue had been talking to Marilyn and trying to get Marilyn to leave him because he was abusive. And apparently he didn't like that very much. So, you know, so that's how that happened. Now, it should be noted that Marty only confessed to the therapist to killing Sue. He did not confess to killing the two boys or to kidnapping and murdering Tina. So he, and he never said who did that. 
Now, if it was his friend Bo, Bo died in 1988. So, you know, th- nothing's going to happen there either because, you know, they're both dead. So, but there are so many weird things about this case. Like, why didn't the kids, allegedly, why didn't the kids hear anything? No one heard any screaming. I think only one witness said they heard screaming coming from the cabin. Even though if you look at the cabin, they're only like a few feet apart. They're very small. They were just like little wooden cabins. So it seems weird that nobody knew what was going on. People have complained that the cops didn't even know that Tina existed, even though Justin told them, hey, there was another 12 year old girl and she was sleeping in here and she's gone now. So it seemed like it took them a really long time before they even started looking for her because they didn't even know she'd been in there. It was just shit like that. And, you know, later on when revelations came to light that Marty Smart had been friends with Doug Thomas you know, then there were kind of rumors of maybe he had covered it up and all this other kind of stuff going on. And maybe they just kind of botched the investigation, you know, quote unquote, accidentally. Now, Cabin 28 was there uh, for a while after the murders. And actually, I think one other family lived in there after the murders. I don't, I'm not sure how long they lived there, but they finally tore it down in 2004. I think just because they were, you know, sick of unsolved murder junkies, like stopping by there and gawking at it and stuff like that. If you go to BuzzFeed Unsolved, uh, the YouTube channel, they have a about a 20 minute examination where the two guys actually go to the site and you can see this pile of rubble, which is presumably from this cabin. And it's kind of creepy. There's other cabins still there, but that one has been torn down. Now, there were actually more developments in the case in late 2016. There was this true crime show and it was called People Magazine Investigates. And they wanted to do kind of an update on the Ketty murders. Now, the case had been reopened in 2013, and evidently one of the new pieces of evidence they found was a letter that Marty Smart had written to his wife, and it said in part, I've paid the price of your love, and now that I've bought it with four people's lives, you tell me we're through. Great, what else do you want? Now, his wife Marilyn says she never got this letter, but when she looked at it, she said, yeah, that's definitely Marty's handwriting. So evidently that was the case that he was upset that Sue Sharp had been interfering in his marriage. And I'm supposing he just, you know, if he did do it, then he killed the other people just because they were there. It does seem weird that he left the two boys alive in the next room, but it should be noted that his son, Justin was also staying in the room with them. So, you know, that might've been a motive for him not to kill them or not to get involved in that situation in there. So that to me kind of suggests that Marty probably is the killer. Now it should be noted too, that someone with a metal detector a few years ago found a hammer and it was in a pond near the cabin where the murders took place. Now, if you'll remember, Marty had told police that he had had a hammer that he had quote unquote misplaced sometime before the murders. So they don't know if this is the hammer that was used in the crime or one of the hammers that was used in the crime, because a couple of, I think one was found at the scene also, but um, it seems likely. And another weird thing is that later on, after the case was reopened, they found a tape at the bottom of the case box and it was in an evidence envelope and it had never been opened, right? And it was a tape of a 911 call from 1984. And this was right after the skull had been found that turned out to be Tina's. But at the point that this 911 call came in, nobody knew that that was Tina's skull. They just knew it was a skull that they had found. So this was an anonymous caller calling 911. And he said that the skull is Tina Sharp. And then he hung up. So that's another thing that leads me to believe that probably the police knew something about this or were covering it up and something like that because they never followed up on this 911 call. They'd never, I mean, it was on the tape. It was at the bottom of this box. Nobody ever even opened it or anything like that. Nobody questioned how did this person know it was Tina Sharp's skull before anybody else knew and all this other kind of shit. So, you know, the whole thing is just really super fishy and super suspicious. So as I said, I'm, I mean, the Ketty murders are probably one of the best known unsolved murder cases in the United States. And I don't know if you'd really call them solved at this point, but it does seem like for sure Martin Smart was involved and maybe his friend Bo was also involved. But as I said, since both of them are dead, there's probably no way that anyone's ever going to know. So it's probably never going to be closed unless 
something crazy happens and it turns out it was some totally random other person, but I'm kind of doubting that at this point. So like I said, still officially unsolved, but probably it was that dude, but he's dead now. So we are at the halfway point of the show, so we are going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about another famously unsolved murder case that has actually probably been solved, maybe, at this point, the Bear Brook murders. And how this whole case has played out, especially in the last couple of years with all these uh, new revelations that have come out about it, is really, really fascinating. So I'm kind of hoping to get into all of that before the end of the show. So we will get into that after the break, and we will be back in just a few minutes. Right, we're back. Uh, I keep saying we, even though Tom's not here. <laughs> so maybe this is a point I will I will put like an interjection of his from some other show so I can feel like he actually is here. So here we go. Just an asshole. There we go. That's much better. <laughs> so anyway, this next case I want to talk about, like I said, this is one that um, you know, years ago would just come up on uh, unsolved murder cases, uh, unsolved murder websites and stuff like that as kind of a creepy unsolved case. Now I should note that even though the main four victims have still not been identified, they still don't know who the victims are, but just recently there was this huge convoluted thing and they think they found out who the killer probably was. Now, I'm going to try and not mess this up because this story is like super complicated and I had to get sources from like all over the place and I'm not going to be able to get super into it because a lot of it has to do with uh, DNA and this and that and, uh, and the other thing. And there's actually a couple really good articles on, I think it's forensicmag.com or forensicmag.org. I can't remember. Um, there's a couple really good, uh, long complex articles about how they kind of figured out the killer of these people. So we're talking about the Bear Brook murders. Now, uh, this is also known as the Allenstown Four, and this is kind of a creepy thing. This happened in Allenstown, New Hampshire. Now, in November 1985, there was a hunter, and he was walking around the Bear Brook State Park, a part of it, and he finds a 55-gallon metal drum uh, near the ruins of this store that had burned down at some time in the past. Now, I don't know what caused him to think this was weird or anything, and maybe they smelled really bad, I'm guessing. So anyway, the cops come, they open the barrels. Inside, there are two bodies, an adult woman and a little girl wrapped in a garbage bag. And they are very decomposed. They've obviously been there for quite a long time. Autopsies determined both of them died of blunt trauma. Now, they couldn't identify them. They were skeletonized. Um, they, you know, they made facial reconstructions and things like that, but no one came forward to identify them. They just buried them both in the same grave. You know, it's, it's a nice grave with a little, you know, unknown woman and child kind of thing on it. 
Now, the creepiest thing about this, I mean, that was bad enough that they find these two bodies and they don't know who they were. But then in May of 2000, which if you're paying attention, that's 15 years later, the police are back in the, the same area for whatever reason, and they find another barrel only about 100 yards from where the first one was found. And guess what was in this one? Two more bodies, two little girls, like little girls between two and four years old. These two little girls also have never been identified. All they know about the woman that was found in 1985, they said she was probably white or Native American, maybe brown hair, between 5'2", five, 5'7". Five, she had a lot of dental work. Now, interestingly... Two of the little girls were maternally related to the woman. That doesn't necessarily mean she was their mom. She could have been their older sister or, her, or their aunt or something like that. Now, the other little girl was not related to the woman. Now, this whole time, because this is a very high profile unsolved case, like I said, they really like to know who these victims are and they still don't know. They've done several uh, reconstructions. They did one in 2013. They did another one in 2015. They're trying to refine them and improve them they're using their dental work and things of that nature. They mostly try to do them in black and white because they're not real sure what their skin tone is or their eye color or anything like that. And they've also tracked the fact that the woman and the children who were related to her were probably living in the Northeast between two weeks and three months before their deaths. Because it should be noted, even though one of the first barrel was found in 85 and the second barrel was found in 2000, that all four of the victims they think were killed sometime between 1977 and 1985. So these were very old bodies. They were mostly um, skeletons, really. Now, so the woman and the two girls that were related, probably from the Northeast. Now, the other little girl, either from the Northeast or upper Midwest. So they're not sure, you know, where they're coming from. But one of them's not related and the other three are. Now, here's the crazy part. And I'm going to try, like I said, I'm going to try and not mess this up because this is super complicated. Okay, so back in 1981, this woman named Denise Bodan disappeared from New Hampshire. But she wasn't reported missing until 2016. And there was actually a reason for that. And I will tell you why later. So fast forward to 2017, actually this month. Now, investigators in San Bernardino, California, had been investigating this cold case about a girl who had been abandoned at an RV park back in 1986. Okay, they were trying to find out where she came from and stuff like that. Now she's going by the name Lisa Jensen. I'm not sure if that's her real name or not, but that's the name she's been using in the press. She's married and has a bunch of kids, apparently has a very happy life now. So she wanted to know uh, what her past was, but she didn't necessarily want a lot of media attention. So I think she's been giving the media a pseudonym. But anyway, so she's been living as Lisa Jensen, but she's, you know, they're investigating who abandoned her back in 1986. Now, the man who abandoned her was supposedly, I mean, he told people that he was her father um, and he was abusive. Now, Lisa Jensen, who was five years old at the time, she knew the man who abandoned her as Robert Evans, who was her mother's boyfriend. And he worked at this RV park as an electrician, handyman type of thing. But I guess um, rumors had started to circulate or he thought he was going to get in trouble because of the um, abuse and stuff like that. So he decided, well, I'm just going to leave her with this family and I'm going to take off. And she says she was with him for about five years. Okay. So while investigators are looking into this case, they take fingerprints from the trailer where him and the little girl lived. Now, these fingerprints were already on file and they matched a man named Curtis Kimball. Curtis Kimball had been arrested in 1985 on a DUI and on endangering the welfare of a child. And the little girl was evidently with him at the time he got arrested. So as they're comparing all these fingerprints, they find out that this Robert Evans person is the same person as Curtis Kimball and has also been arrested or known under another pseudonym, Gordon Jensen. And they were also able to identify him from booking photos and things of that nature. Now, this dude was arrested again in 1988 for driving a stolen vehicle. He had stolen it in Idaho and he was driving it to California. Now, whoever owned the car that was stolen actually knew the guy, but knew him under a different name. So this dude is just like drifting all over the place, like using different aliases and pseudonyms. Okay, so he was locked up and then he got released in 1990 and then he disappears again for another 12 years or so. Now, in 2002, 
the same dude, and I think he's using the name Robert Evans still, he gets arrested for murder. And this woman that he murdered was his wife, quote unquote. I'm not sure if it was common law or if they were legally married. It seems like most, some sources say wife, but some sources say they weren't really married. Um, she was a chemist. Her name was Yoon Soon Jun, and uh, that was in Richmond, California. Now, he bashed her in the head, tried to cut her up, and then left her body under a huge pile of cat litter in the basement of her house, right? Okay, so the guy was arrested for that. Now, since at this point, they know that this guy is the same guy that abandoned this Lisa Jensen woman when she was five years old back in 1986, they're doing DNA tests, and they've done DNA tests on her. Now, they discover that... Robert Evans is not her biological father. Now, at this stage, uh, he got 15 years for the murder, which seems not very much, but you know, okay. And he actually died in 2010, natural causes, okay? Which, you know, what are you gonna do? Now, the interesting thing about this is that by doing DNA on Lisa Jensen, and it's way too complicated for me to get into, like I said, but there's a couple really good articles on Forensic Mag that kind of go into how they found out where she had come from and how she was related because they had to do all this triangulation and geographical kind of stuff and everything like that. But they found out that she was originally from the New Hampshire area and that her mother was Denise Baudin. And like I said, this woman had disappeared in 1981. However, her boyfriend at the time was Robert Evans, okay? This dude that had cut up this woman and left her under cat litter. So at this point, now Denise Bodan was not reported missing in 1981 because evidently um, her family saw her and this Robert Evans person um, over Thanksgiving and he was saying, oh, they're having financial problems and stuff like that. And he was kind of able to manipulate the family into saying, oh, you know, we were, we're going to move, Right. So oddly enough, he kind of was able to hold them off by saying, yeah, she's fine. We just moved over here, blah, 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 which seems a little odd for that long a time. But, you know, I don't know how close her family was or whatever like that. But nobody reported her missing until night until uh, 2016 when they determined that Lisa Jensen was her daughter, who was originally named Dawn Bodan. OK, her name. She changed her name later on. Because obviously she got abandoned and she didn't know her mother, who her mother was and stuff like that. But her, her name was, uh, her birth name was Don Bodan. So at this point, they're assuming since this guy had last been seen with Denise Bodan and since he had her daughter with him, who he had abandoned five years after Denise went missing, then they're assuming that he killed Denise. Although it should be said that they have not found her body yet. Now, another thing that's interesting, though, okay, so since they found out, since they knew who Denise was and who Don Bodan, aka Lisa Jensen was, and they knew where they came from, and the place where they came from in New Hampshire was very, very close to where the Bear Brook victims had been found in the 55-gallon drums, okay? Now, one investigator put some things together and he's like, oh, maybe we should check out a connection there because this guy is kind of looking like a serial killer. So the DNA tests on the bodies and the DNA tests of this killer, one of the little girls in the barrels is related to him. The others are not. So he, they're thinking he is the father of one of the little girls in there, although they still don't know who she is. Now, after all this rigmarole, he had so so many aliases. I mean, it just seemed like he was just drifting all over the country. He worked as a handyman, an electrician and stuff like that. He was just drifting everywhere and evidently just killing people on a whim. So they actually don't know how many people he killed. They are assuming that he probably killed the four females that were found in the barrels. But again, they don't know who they are. They only know that he is probably the father of one of them. Now they determined that his real identity was Terry Rasmussen. And this guy was originally from Denver, Colorado. He was in the Navy, uh, from which he was discharged in 1967. He had a wife. He married in 1969. He and his wife lived in Phoenix, Arizona, and then in Redwood City, California. And they had four children. And uh, his wife then left him at some point in 1973, 1974. 
Now, the last time that his family says they saw him was Christmas of 1974. And after that, he kind of fell off the grid. So it must have been after his wife left him or took the kids or something like that. Then it seems like he went on this wandering killing spree is what it's looking like at this point. So the creepy thing about this is just this one girl that, I mean, she's a woman now, but she was a girl when she got abandoned. And this whole thing about her wanting to find out where she came from, because all she could remember, because like I said, she was abandoned when she was five. She's like, all I can remember is just being with this guy who beat me up and he had kidnapped me from somewhere. She didn't even really say much about remembering her mother or where her mother had gone. Because like I said, her mother disappeared in 1981 when she was still a baby. So she didn't even really remember any of that. And it just seemed so crazy that her wanting to find out where she came from and them doing all this triangulation and stuff like that. And it took this long, but they actually uncovered a serial killer that they didn't know about. And they think that he is almost definitely the guy that killed those people in the barrels. Now, like I said, unfortunately, they do not still do not know who who those four women are other than one of them is almost definitely his daughter. And like I said, if you really want kind of the ins and outs of all the DNA triangulation and all the stuff that they did to find out who she was and who she was related to and stuff like that, because it was very, very convoluted. They had to go through all these other relatives and stuff like that. And the only reason that they found out who Robert Evans, a.k.a. Terry Rasmussen was, was because they used the DNA of one of his sons from his marriage back in the 70s to find out who he was and who he was related to and stuff like that. So, but there are articles on Forensic Mag and they're really interesting if you're into that kind of stuff, which I am. Um, So you can get a lot more details there about how they kind of uncovered this whole case. It's really cool because it's just like this whole mission. I mean, it's not cool because, you know, this dude was a horrible person who killed a bunch of people. But, you know, it's cool in the way that they solved it, like after all this time. And in a way, it kind of made me feel better because I was like, wow, just even though that the case is so old and even though when they were investigating her case... They didn't even really know that there was a murder case. They were just kind of investigating her having been abandoned when she was five. And it's kind of cool that they put so much time and effort into trying to find out who she was. And, and, you know, it was just kind of luck, really, that it sort of led to this much bigger thing where they actually ended up solving one of the biggest unsolved crimes. Well, probably the biggest unsolved crime in New Hampshire and one of the best known ones in the United States. So I thought that was really awesome. So if you want to read more about it, just go check out that website. I'll put some links in the description. But the nice thing about it is that now they know who the probable killer was. Um, I think it becomes, it's much more likely that they will probably eventually find out who those victims were too, because they'll be able to triangulate the geography and where he was at uh, certain points in time and stuff like that. Now, they should also be noted, I read that uh, in Manchester, New Hampshire, there had been another woman living with him who went by the name Elizabeth Evans. And they're not sure if she's missing or maybe got murdered or something like that, because they're not sure if that's her real name or not. So there might be many, many more victims of this person, um, all over the place that they haven't discovered. And because this guy went under so many different names and shit like that, actually the media started calling him the chameleon killer because he had shit. He had a shit ton of different aliases. And along with all of the aliases that he uh, went by, there's also a lot of gaps in time where his whereabouts are unaccounted for. And these include from 1974 to 1978, 1981 to 1984, and 1986 to 1988. So they don't know where he was during those years. So it's probable that he probably killed more people during those time periods and they haven't found their bodies yet or something like that. So, you know, that's not cool, but at least they know who this guy is. Like I said, he's dead now. He died in prison uh, for the murder of uh, Yoon Soon Jun, who he left under kitty litter. And uh, so that's how that happened. Now, I guess we're getting to the end of the show and I hope you guys... (laughs) I hope you guys will forgive me because I didn't realize how hard it would be to do this show by myself. Like, because, you know, what I'm usually doing and I have Tom here to bounce off of, I can, I can look at him while I'm talking and stuff like that instead of just like sitting in my office by myself and talking to myself like an idiot. I mean, you know, I'm talking to you guys, but you're not in front of my face, so I can't really see you. So um, hopefully I, I just got to update. Um, they're actually going to do quadruple bypass and they're on Tom's dad. And they are going to do it on Tuesday, the same day that this comes out. I'm actually recording it a couple days beforehand, um, so I don't know the outcome of it. But they're going to do the surgery on Tuesday. Now, 
Tom has a flight back to Florida scheduled for Friday, the Friday after this podcast comes out. But we'll see how that goes. Um, he might have to delay it, you know, depending on how the surgery goes and stuff like that. Although he is planning to come back on Friday, which means that um, I'm going to do another movie review. But like I said, I'll probably do it by myself because I like to have them up on Friday or Saturday. And he's not coming back into town until late Friday night. So I don't want to make him have to record a movie review and stuff like that. So I'll probably be one by myself. So hopefully... Me being by myself hasn't been super annoying for you guys. And like I said, maybe at some points in here, I'll, come, you know, put some stuff in like, you know, I'll put somebody, somebody on Facebook told me that I should put in sounds of Tom vaping, like to make it sound like he was really here. So I might actually do that because I think that's kind of a funny idea because, you know, and it's kind of a bummer, but I really do kind of miss him. And, you know, because this is... I mean, we've been together like uh, six and a half years, almost seven years, and we have not been apart at any point since then. I mean, at one point he was in the hospital for a few days, but that's not really the same because I could go every day and visit him. Um, so this is kind of weirding me out. I'm weirded out. Our kitten is weirded out <laughs> that he's not here. So, but it'll be okay. I'm going to try and muddle through. And hopefully, like I said, you guys enjoyed this episode, even though it was just me blabbering and talking to myself. So that will do it for this true crime episode. If you like the show, please remember to like, share, subscribe, uh, share on all your social media, because that really does help. Also, if you'd like to support the show in some small way or in a big way, that'd be nice too. <laughs> no pressure though. Um, then just go to our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast. If you don't like Patreon and would rather make a one-time donation or would rather just give through PayPal, then you can go to our blog, which is 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com. And there's a link in the sidebar to a PayPal account. Also, be sure to go to Zazzle.com slash 13 o'clock, and we have some t-shirts there for sale. I promise I'm going to make, because some people have made a couple of t-shirt suggestions, um, so I'm actually working on a Where's That Raccoon design, <laughs> which is our catchphrase from a haunting, and uh, I also am working on a Summerton Man t-shirt which hopefully will come out cool. Uh, we'll see how that goes. So I am actually working on new t-shirt designs. There's six or seven on there at the moment. So go check those out. And that will do it for episode 74, the lonely true crime episode. See you guys next week. Bye. The murder mystery may be the work of a serial killer, four bodies, and a woman still missing and feared dead. Investigators now believe one killer is responsible for all that horrific violence and his wife's murder out west. WBZ's Louisa Moeller is live in Allenstown tonight, where, Louisa, there may be more victims. And Lisa, that's why investigators want to come back here to search the very same spot in the spring where the bodies of a woman and three girls were found. They're also hoping all this media coverage will help bring their loved ones forward. I took my flashlight and looked in and you could see there was something white inside the plastic bag. So I peeled back a little of the plastic bag and that's when you could see that there was bones in there. Retired New Hampshire really State Police Detective John Cody vividly remembers the moment when he stumbled upon a rusty metal drum, two bodies stuffed inside. Investigators revealing Thursday it was the work of a serial killer with multiple names and identities. They've linked the man known in New Hampshire as Bob Evans to two local cold cases. Now we know who the killer is. We're hoping that leads us to the identity of the victims and location of other victims in this case. In 1981, Denise Bowden, her infant daughter, and Evans disappeared from their Manchester home. Her family thought she left willingly and didn't report her missing until last month. Last week, investigators searched the home but found no human remains. In 1985, hunters found a large metal drum in Allenstown's Bear Brook State Park. Then, in 2000, the second drum was found by Cody. In all, four unidentified victims, a woman, two girls related to her, and another girl were found inside. The third girl investigators discovered through DNA is the daughter of Bob Evans. Who's the father for the rest of the, the victims in this case is still a question out there. In 2002, Evans was arrested in California under the name Lawrence Vanner. He was convicted of killing his wife of less than a year, Yoon Sun Jun, and died in prison in 2010. 
And on top of all that, there's also this. Police say Evans raised Denise Bowden's daughter until she was about five years old. That's when they say he put her up for adoption. Well, she's now an adult living in California. And according to a letter read by investigators, she's living a happy family life. Live in Allenstown, New Hampshire, Louisa Moeller, WBZ News.